Now, smartphone cameras have gone completely mental in 2022 with a couple of mobile manufacturers serving up 200 megapixel monsters for shooting your everyday existence. From shiny expensive flagship phones to affordable mid-rangers, here's my pick of the very best camera smartphones you can have yourself as 2022 comes to a close. And if money happens to be a bit tight, don't worry, you don't have to put up with crappy photos. I've bunged together my pick of the very best budget-friendly camera smartphones as well in a separate video. I'll try and remember to put a link thing up there, but frankly, I'll probably forget. So, sorry about that. And for more on the latest and greatest tech, please do poke subscribe and ding that notifications bell. Cheers! So one of the most obvious choices for proper good smartphone optics is Google's Pixel 7 or the more expensive but even more impressive Pixel 7 Pro. These flagship phones are less expensive than some rivals but they serve up some seriously slick hardware and a shag load of excellent Pixel exclusive features that make life just that little bit easier. That Tensor chipset isn't as beefy as Qualcomm's latest Snapdragon but the Pixel 7 phones can still blaze through a bit of Genshin impact on demand while battery life is pretty bloody good too. When it comes to the cameras, that primary sensor hasn't changed up at all from last year's 50 megapixel Octopd quad beer effort. And I would say it's a mite disappointing that there's no hardware upgrade here, but as that old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't f**k about with it. And things most certainly ain't broke because the Pixel 7 pair boasts the best point and shoot camera performance of any smartphone in 2022. When you're shooting people or animals, you can swap to the excellent portrait mode and get gorgeous results with bokeh that you can mess about with in post-processing if you wanna. And the pixels boast a swift shutter speed too, so you can capture loads of photos in quick succession and make sure you nail those blink and you'll miss a moments. Complicated shots tainted with strong contrast aren't a problem either, especially using Google's handy on-screen brightness sliders. And even if the lighting is full on, you won't see much saturation and colors will appear natural. Google's night vision mode can be automatically activated by the phone whenever the lighting is cack and I would recommend not fiddling with that particular setting as it makes a real difference, essentially allowing you to see in the dark. Absolutely stellar stuff. And both Pixel 7 smartphones also offer up a alternative 12 megapixel ultra wide angle shooter. And while colours aren't quite as realistic with this option, it is there if you want to fit more into frame. Now when it comes to that camera tech, the major advantage that the Pixel 7 Pro has over its regular sibling is the fact that it's got a 48 megapixel telephoto lens on there with five times optical zoom. And that's bolstered by a bit of optical image stabilization just like the primary shooter and it's an option that's just straight up cut out of the regular Pixel 7. When you're capturing a photo between 2.5 times and 5 times zoom levels, you'll end up with a hybrid photo stitched together from images taken with the primary and the telephoto sensors, meaning pleasingly crisp detail and no compromises. And when you push in over the 5 times zoom level, it's telephoto all the way. And I've got to say, even most of the way up to the 30 times zoom cap, I got some bloody good results. This is easily one of the best telephoto shooters that I've ever tested, perfect for snapping kids, pets, anything that you don't want to disturb for natural looking images. Even in very low light, it doesn't fall apart, producing quite crisp results with help from that stabilization. And I gotta admit, I really missed that telephoto option whenever I was just snapping away with the regular Pixel 7. Yeah, it's, it's just like, oh, why? Arr. Switch things up with a bit of video, and again, these Pixels do a great job with minimal effort. You don't have an AK option, but my 4K test clips were crisp and detailed enough to enjoy on a telly screen, with detail levels only really dropping when the lighting became more problematic. Vibrant colours are again ably captured, and you can swap between all of the lenses as you record. And this isn't too jarring, although colour accuracy does take a hit when you're away from that primary sensor. The telephoto lens on the Pixel 7 Pro is particularly impressive in low light, while the optical image stabilisation once again counters any vicious hand sway, caused by a few too many surprisingly strong lagers. And as for audio, well, I'd have preferred some better wind cancellation, but otherwise it's top stuff. The Pixel 7s come with a cinematic mode, which, like Samsung's portrait video mode, adds a bokeh-style effect behind your subject, although a month on, this hasn't improved at all. If your subject moves at all, the Pixel easily loses track and goes a bit berserk, so for now, just avoid. And likewise, all the motion stuff which can add fake motion blur or mimic a long exposure shot is okay, but it can be quite shonky and frankly feels a bit gimmicky and I imagine most people wouldn't even bother touching it. And if you get yourself the Pixel 7 Pro, where well, you'll also find you've got a macro mode on board, 
And this can automatically activate whenever you get really, really close up to something. We're talking like a couple of centimeters away. What it does is it automatically switches to the ultra wide angle shooter, which on the Pro has an auto focus, unlike the regular Pixel 7, hence you don't get that macro mode here. And the results aren't bad at all, although I still prefer to just take high-res images on phones with massive camera sensors and then simply crop in as you don't have any stress from shadows or other issues. And one of the other new highlights of taking photos on these Pixel phones is the Photo de-blur feature as well, which to be honest I really didn't have to use very often at all because it's very rare to get a blurry shot on these two. And I gotta admit I'm still not convinced. It can help a little bit with blur, but it's not quite the miracle tool that some are making it out to be. It's certainly not as immediately valuable and impressive as Google's tool, which wipes out any background stragglers, effectively eliminating them from existence. But hopefully over time, with a good bit of machine learning or whatever, that de blur tool will really be worth its weight in gold. And last up for the optics, both Pixel 7 phones pack a simple 10.8 meg fixed focus selfie shooter, which has been okay for those social media snaps. In low light, it's once again sometimes a bit crap, vomiting out blurry, unsavoury pics, especially if you're not entirely still. Definitely best used when conditions are favourable. Now, if you can't quite stretch to some Pixel 7 action, well, no bother. Google's Pixel 6a is a fraction of the price and yet still offers a great selection of features and some dependable hardware. The camera sensors may be older tech, but the 6a can still capture better looking pics than basically any mid-range mobile out there. Now, 12.2 meg primary setup comes with built-in optical image stabilization and it's ideal for snapping anything and everything your gorgeous little heart desires. It's a real point and shoot effort. Just aim the camera in generally the right direction and that's about all the brain power you'll need to get good looking photos. If you're struggling against a bright background or some other HDR shenanigans, you can manually tweak the exposure levels with a quick swipe of your finger. An easy alteration for even better results. Google's cameras are masters when it comes to capturing colours just as they look in real life, even when the light is a bit pants. And night sight is fully automatic these days, so as long as you keep your hands still for a second or so, you'll get bright pics that aren't plagued by noise. And unlike most other manufacturers, Google does only serve up a very small selection of bonus camera modes and tools to play around with. So for instance, there's no pro mode to speak of, but there is a portrait mode that can be depended on to keep your subject crisp while smudging out the background. And the Pixel 6a also gives you the option of a 12 meg ultra wide shooter, which unlike most rivals can once again capture pretty natural looking snaps. Colours aren't distorted too much beyond a slight deepening of those bright blue skies and so on. For your home movies, you can shoot 4K video at 30 or 60 frames per second. And again, I approve of the stuff that this thing churns out. Vivid colours are again captured in full glory with plenty of details stuffed into every frame. Image stabilisation impresses, keeping the picture as still as possible, even when you're walking at pace or piddling about on a boat. And any voices chatting around the phone are cleanly picked up, even against full-on background noise. It's only when things get a bit darker that the Pixel 6a struggles, serving up quite murky results overall. Now the only real disappointment with the old Pixel 6 camera setup was the selfie camera, which proved frustratingly limited compared with the rear optics. Hence, I didn't exactly have high expectations when it came to snapping my mug with the Pixel 6a. Thankfully, this selfie shooter is actually pretty good, even when you move indoors into quite dingy spaces, as long as you and any fellow selfies aren't flapping about the place. It's not too phased by high contrast shenanigans either, and again, like video capture, it's not until things get proper dark that it all gets a bit murky and not very nice to look at. And if you want to shoot a vlog or something with that front facing camera, it's full HD resolution capture, no 4K option sadly. It's quite zoomed in as well and you don't have an option to zoom out, just zoom in even further, which oh, nobody needs that. Now a hot rival for the Pixel 7 phones comes courtesy of Apple with its latest iPhone 14 series of smartphones and their just as flamboyant camera design. If you want the beefiest hardware, you will need to spunk out a grand for the Pro or Pro Max models, which sport a fresh new 48 megapixel sensor with upgraded optical image stabilization. But does that mean that your photos and videos will look even nicer than ever before? Well, in general, the iPhone performs really well with natural lighting, and even quite harsh conditions like shooting into the sun won't automatically mean you get a terrible pick. Halo effects and flare aren't too bad at all, if not quite as good as rival phones with Zeiss lenses. Snap a pic of a vibrant subject like a pretty flower or this frankly ugly pumpkin which looks like a stomach twist in close-up of a teenager's facial pose and you'll get eye-creamingly pleasing results. 
The sweep and vistas also tend to come out well, packed with impressive detail and boasted natural sky tones. My portrait shots also looked rather lovely, with a successful bit of bokeh style blurring and the usual filters for more extreme effects. Unfortunately, ambient and low light shots can look rather flat and grainy still, despite the larger sensor and pixel binning, while moving subjects will inevitably end up all blurry. It's here that the Pixel phones show their superiority, especially as Apple's night mode isn't quite as dependable as Google's night sight. Once again, the Pro Max comes packing a 12 megapixel ultra wide angle lens with 120 degree field of view, and this can again cope quite well with strong HDR situations with only slightly warmer colours on display. And this is also automatically swapped to for macro shots if that's right up your alley. When you start to zoom, the primary sensor handles the action until you hit the three times level, at which point the dedicated 12 meg telephoto shooter takes over. This serves up more basic optical image stabilization, but it's still more than good enough to get a stable shot without much trouble. Unfortunately, however, the maximum zoom here is 15 times, which is inferior to many Android rivals. But while the likes of the Pixel 7 Pro offers sharper, better looking telephoto pics, the iPhone should satisfy anyone who's hoping to get a perfect touristy shot or just an unobtrusive snap of their kids, cats, whatever. For home movies, you can capture footage at up to 4K resolution with your choice of 24, 30 or 60 frames per second. This once again stumbles somewhat in low light conditions, offering murky visuals and some soft focus which pales in comparisons to rivals like Oppo's Find X5. But in better light, you will get sharp, attractive looking video with minimal disruption when you're cycling between the different lenses. You've also got a cinematic mode which adds bokeh style blur into your footage and you've got an action mode too which helps to smooth out your video when you are moving and shooting simultaneously. No bother with audio capture either, those mics do a bang up job. And then last up for your selfie needs, you've got a 12 meg camera with autofocus and it's the same old story here. This works just fine in most lighting conditions but things do get grainy and blurry when the lighting ain't great. And with that front facing selfie cam you can also shoot up to 4K resolution Ultra HD footage at either 24 or 30 frames per second and again absolutely spot on for a bit of Skype and zoom and whatever else you need to do. Another magnificent camera phone that hit the UK in 2022 is the Oppo Find X5 Pro. This is a gold star smartphone in pretty much every area from the excellent battery life to the tip top performance and that satisfying user experience. But the real highlight here is that versatile camera setup, even if the telephoto lens isn't quite as impressive as some rivals. The primary sensor is Sony's IMX766, which has been used by quite a lot of smartphones recently, but Oppo has added extra smarts in there to ensure top quality results. So for one, you've got some next level 5-axis image stabilization built into this thing, supposed to help you out with your low light photography. You've also got a lens which is constructed from glass, and that'll help prevent any, you know, halo and effects or the light-based shenanigans that might bugger up your shot. And most importantly, photos are processed by Oppo's own Marasilicon Imogen NPU, rather than the Snapdragon chipset that runs the show. But does this actually make for more realistic, good-looking pics? Well, the Oppo Find X5 Pro is a very dependable snapper at least 9 times out of 10. The majority of my test shots taken in auto mode came out remarkably true to life, with similar results to Google's excellent Pixel 6 smartphones. HDR situations are generally well handled, with plenty of details still popping up in those darker areas, and not much flaring in the lighter bits, although I definitely did see some saturation in some of my test photos. Those colours occasionally come out a little bit bleached, nothing extreme, but it definitely does make your pic look less pretty. Good news if you're a night owl, because I got next to no blur in my evening shots thanks to the excellent stabilisation, even after I'd quaffed quite a few shandies. Although if your subject is moving as you take the shot, this will result in some blurry shenanigans. But colour reproduction is again close to natural, even when the light is rather sparse, and you still get a good amount of detail crammed into every frame. The camera software has actually been updated a couple of times since I started testing out the Oppo Find X5 Pro, although I haven't noticed any real change in the performance to be perfectly honest. I'm kind of hoping that they do manage to deal retroactively with some of the saturation issues though. Now one of the snazzy exclusive new features here are the three new Hasselblad Master style filters as designed by a trio of pro photographer dudes. And they are Radiance, Serenity and Emerald. My favourite is definitely Radiance because this turns the sky a crazy cartoonish colour that makes every outdoor photo really stand out. You've also now got the lovably bonkers Hasselblad X-Pan mode, which replicates a vintage shooting experience with a panorama style 65 by 24 aspect ratio. I'm not sure when this would ever really come in useful to be honest, but whatever, it is fun to bugger about with occasionally. The Oppo Find X5 Pro also serves up a 50 megapixel ultra wide angle lens, 
with a 110 degree view and the image processing is once again powered by Marisilicon like all the other cameras here. If the lighting is strong you'll generally capture natural tones again although you do often end up with colder photos in sort of lower light but even then you'll generally still get crisp photos stuffed with detail and it is a proper lifesaver when you're trying to shoot touristy pics of massive buggers like this thing. And last up is the 13 megapixel telephoto lens with its 2 times optical zoom. You don't get any periscope tech here unfortunately, so this isn't as effective as some rivals like the S22 Ultra. This maxes out at a 20 times zoom, and to be honest there's no real point in going above 10 times zoom level, because at that point things are generally starting to look a bit fuzzy and occasionally not quite in focus. Still, at that 10 times level I found I got pretty much always a consistently good shot of a distant subject. You could also punch in towards a living subject like a fluffy kitty cat without intruding in their personal space. Now let's shift on to video which you can capture up to 4K resolution at either 30 or 60 frames per second. Even at that Ultra HD setting you'll get smooth visuals when you're moving and shooting thanks to the excellent stabilisation while the image quality in general is crisp and appealing. The Finex 5 Pro works well in HDR situations capturing stronger detail in the lighter and the darker areas compared with some of the competition. You can zoom in and out easily enough and the phone automatically swaps between the lenses to suit without too jarring an effect. Noise levels are minimal when you're shooting at night as well courtesy of that good old Mazza processing unit although this does tend to drain the battery life quite quickly. And no real complaints on the audio side, the phone captures everything going on all around without much wind distortion when things do get a bit gusty. And last up that 32 megapixel selfie cam is another solid effort. Snap away in sunnier climbs and you'll still enjoy sharp, well-balanced pics, no worries. Those filters are back in action as well, although radiance ain't quite as effective with this lens, sadly. In more ambient light, you will get softer results and once again some blur as well if anyone actually dares to move, so you'll definitely want to pause and freeze. But the Oppo Find X5 Pro can automatically switch viewing angles to fit in extra heads when needed, which is a nice touch. If you don't have over a grand to spunk on your new smartphone, well maybe check out the regular Oppo Find X5 instead, which costs a few hundred quid less, but still packs some excellent optics. Now, Samsung's S22 Ultra certainly got plenty of YouTubers spaffing in their shorts as usual this year, and while it isn't one of my absolute favourite phones of 2022, especially in this here Exynos flavour, there is no denying that those optics are impressive. If you want the Samsung smartphone with the best camera tech right now and you've got enough cash stuffed in your mattress to chalk a barracuda, then you should be satisfied. The S22 Ultra churns out good looking photos 9 times out of 10 with very little effort. I did see a little saturation in some of my test photos when the sun was being a proper knob and shining in a really awkward place, but in most circumstances the S22 Ultra can happily deal with strong lighting and deep contrast. That focus is fast acting as is the image processing so you'll rarely miss a shot because the camera can't keep up. Indoor shots can certainly still look a little soft and warm unless the lighting is particularly good but the S22 Ultra can still make the most of the situation more often than not as long as your subject isn't doing anything annoying like moving about the place. Any flapping can really flummox this phone. And at night the Ultra really excels compared with many rivals. Only the very best phones like the Oppo Find X5 Pro and the Pixel 6 can replicate a scene so vividly with so little light to work with. The dedicated night mode can also help brighten up things a bit when needed. Meanwhile the ultra wide angle shooter serves up an eye catch and pulled back view when you're snapping some scenery and without too much distortion or other issues. Colours are a bit off at night and in low light but overall it's still one of the better efforts out there. However, the real reason to get the Ultra over other Samsung smartphones is the ridiculous space zoom. Up to around the 30x zoom mark you'll still get sharp detailed shots which is an absolute godsend when you're trying to snap wildlife or kids without intruding on the action. It even works pretty well at night, although whatever the conditions, once you pass that 30x zoom level you will notice that the detail in your pics drops quite dramatically and by 50 times and above things are looking decidedly dire. As ever, Samsung has piled a ton of bonus camera modes into the Ultra, including a food mode which does actually make your grub look more appetising. The portrait mode usually works pretty well, adding a convincing bokeh style effect to your photos, although if you are unhappy you can always reverse the effect afterwards. And then there's my personal favourite, the single take mode, which spaffs out a whole bunch of quirky photos and video clips captured over a short time frame, definitely perfect for shooting your kids random antics. I also highly rate the Samsung S22 Ultra when it comes to the home movies. 
That stabilization is fantastic. Even at 4K resolution, you can actually shoot smooth looking footage when you're dangling from a Jeep and even when you're aiming at a moving subject while using the telephoto lens. Although don't zoom in too far or yes, this will likely happen. Swapping between the different lenses is a relatively smooth experience, giving you the flexibility to zoom in and out with just a quick tap while recording. Moving subjects look smooth on playback and as with snapping photos, as long as the lighting conditions are decent, you will get plenty of detail packed into every frame. Shooting video at night isn't much of a problem either, if not quite as impressive as the Find X5 phones. Things can get a bit grainy, but no worse than with many other handsets. An audio pickup is just as good. My test videos boast rich stereo sound with clear recording from all directions, but favouring whatever is directly in front of the lens. The selfie shooter does a decent job too. Like the rear cam, this can handle strong lighting without having a breakdown, while the view can be expanded if you want to fit in more mates or more background action. Again, in low light, the results can be a bit soft and grainy, and you will want to keep your hands super steady to avoid any blur. Not an easy task when clutching a massive beer, having already drunk two massive beers. For a bit less cash, you can always grab Samsung's regular Galaxy S22 or the S22 Plus instead. The regular S22 was the one I really wanted to love as it's one of very few smartphones released in 2022 you could actually just about get away with calling compact. Unfortunately, despite boasting strong media chops and the usual enjoyable One UI experience, the Exynos version of the S22 is crippled by dreadful battery life. I'd recommend grabbing the Plus model instead, sadly it isn't as compact of course, but you'll not be desperately scrambling for the charger at 5pm, which is always a bonus. And no matter your choice, you'll once again get some respectable camera tech that once again allows for brain-free shooting and is absolutely brimming with bonus features. For your photos, yeah, the S22 does still occasionally boost those colours to make a scene look more appealing, but not as bad as some Samsung blows of the past. This phone is fantastic when it comes to capturing action shots of kids, cats and other mobile subjects. The shutter speed is generally fast enough to tap and snap lots of pics in quick succession. Unless you're snapping away in low light, that is, in which case you'd be waiting a good couple of seconds for each image to be captured and processed. Still, the Galaxy S22 generally copes well with strong light and contrast. I only really saw any real saturation when I was practically shooting into the sun. And when you move indoors or to darker areas, the S22 still copes well, capturing enough finer details so your photo will look good when you chuck it up onto a TV or monitor. Tin as good in low light as the Pixel 6 series smartphones or the Oppo Find X5 series as well, but it'll do the job. The primary camera sensor is once again joined by a 12 meg ultra wide angle lens, which does as well as expected, proven up to the task of snapping more dramatic results. And while the 10 meg telephoto shooter with a 3x optical zoom isn't a patch on the Ultra's space zoom shenanigans, it's still very handy for getting closer to your subject without disturbing them. But of course, this wouldn't be a Samsung smartphone without like a gajillion different bonus camera modes. That portrait mode is as impressive as always, allowing you to adjust the severity of the bokeh after you take the shot, although the edge detection does occasionally get a bit janky. My personal favourite, however, is still that single take mode, which is great when your kids or pets are up to something. This not only captures a short video clip, but it also serves up a variety of filtered pics and comedically bizarre GIF style efforts that are highly shareable. Standard video can be captured at up to 8K resolution, which is a hit and miss affair. I prefer keeping the S22 at Ultra HD level with a choice of 30 or 60 frames per second filming. Picture quality is ruddy great, even with lots of motion in the shot. And once again, the visuals aren't too troubled by tricky conditions like high contrast scenes. Audio is clearly captured from all directions. And even when things are a bit breezy, that sound wasn't distorted much at all. Overall, top stuff, although the Oppo Find X5 still has it beat in low light. And last up, the S22 serves up another 10 meg selfie cam, which may have a low megapixel count compared with many rivals, but I was happy enough with the results. Processing times are again long in low light, but you don't end up with much grain, and there's enough room to fit in plenty of heads when needed. Now one camera phone that is a bit trickier to track down here in the west, but is well worth that effort, is the Vivo X80 Pro. This sports some seriously premium specs, including the Snapdragon HN1 chipset with dedicated cooling tech for gaming fans, plus a big old battery with 80 watt wide and 50 watt wireless charging support. 
We probably won't be particularly shocked to learn, given its inclusion in this list, that it is the camera tech that really helps to elevate the Vivo X80 Pro above many of its peers. Those lenses are coated in Zeiss's T-Star glass, which helps to prevent ghosting and other light-related issues from buggering up your perfectly good shot. While you also get Vivo's exceedingly clever 5-axis gimbal stabilization built in to help you get crystal clear super sharp shots even in very low light. With help from this clever hardware, the Vivo X80 Pro's 50 meg Samsung GNV sensor combined with the V1 Plus image processor spaffs out some impressively natural looking photos with poppy colours where appropriate. These pics were among the best I've seen outside of Google's fresh flagships. Even in strong daylight, I was impressed with the results thanks to the Zeiss glass. It's incredibly rare to see any kind of flaring or saturation. And in more ambient light, when shooting indoors or in the evenings, you can once again expect a crisp photo with limited noise and accurate colour reproduction. The Vivo X80 Pro also packs a 48 megapixel ultra wide shooter and a dedicated 12 megapixel portrait snapper using Sony's IMX663 sensor, ideal for snapping your subject up close while blurring out the background. And last up, there's an 8 meg periscope lens which helps you get great family or wildlife shots without getting right up in their grill. You can record video at up to 8K resolution, but I stuck with 4K for most of my testing time. I was more than happy with what I saw. Plenty of detail, punchy colours, highly respectable image stabilisation, and the audio came through just as cleanly. And last up, the 32 meg selfie cam is again a bit good, whether shooting in low light or brighter environments. Basically, I'm struggling to find anything to complain about with this camera tech. It's reliable at pretty much any time of day, even on full auto. And also, if your budget can't quite reach up to the Vivo X80 Pro, well, definitely don't sleep on the V23 Pro, which is another fantastic Vivo smartphone which packs great camera tech, again, capable of capturing natural looking snaps in almost any conditions, and that one will come in at a cheaper price. Now, another one of my favourite affordable flagship smartphones of 2022 is the Xiaomi 12T Pro, which comes packing top tier tech, including a Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 for silky smooth performance and 120 watt fast charging support. Not bad at all for the 699 quid asking price. But it's the camera tech that really impresses here, courtesy of that schlong swinging 200 megapixel Samsung HP1 sensor. Now you won't get 200 meg images every time you hit that shutter button. In the regular auto mode, you've got 16 in one pixel binning, which gives you 12.5 meg photos. This level of pixel binning is good for more ambient conditions. It generally means brighter results with less noise. And it works well for everyday snaps. The phone can handle harsh contrast without cacking itself and colors aren't boosted either. It is very impressive stuff all round. But if you dive into the more section and hit Ultra HD, this will then capture 50 megapixel photos using four in one pixel binning. So the image resolution goes up from 4096 by 3072 all the way up to 8192 by 6144. And the image capture is still nice and swift, although there is a bit of processing downtime. So I don't exactly expect burst shooting here. So at least you don't have to hang around while your arm grows stiff. And this mode still works well in lower light situations and colors only appear slightly less natural than with that 16 in one pixel binning. Alternatively, if 50 meg still isn't sharp enough for you, well, you can hit this 200 megapixel icon right here at the top, and this will step it right up into ludicrous mode. And even when shooting a 200 megapixel image, the Xiaomi 12T Pro is again pretty nippy, and yes, you get that process and downtime where you can't really do much, but it certainly seems faster than Motorola's Edge 30 Ultra, and yeah, just all around very impressive stuff. As long as you're not shooting at that crazy resolution, you do have eye autofocus, as you can see demonstrated on the lovely Veronica here. And again, this works really well for living subjects. Locks on immediately, it isn't disturbed by fast, jerky motions, and you've got the usual portrait mode shenanigans too. Sadly, the other camera lens is slapped here on the back end of the Xiaomi 12T Pro, not particularly thrilling. You've got an 8 megapixel ultra wide angle and a 2 megapixel macro sensor. No telephoto or other posh stuff like that, but to be fair, with the 200 megapixel photo mode, photos are packed with so much fine detail that you can digitally crop right into a pic and you'll still get crisp results as long as you don't go completely mental. In fact, this right here is comparable to what I saw with Sony's Xperia 5 Mark IV using its dedicated telephoto lens. And yeah, you've got plenty of other modes to play around with in here as well, including a full-on pro mode, you've got the portrait mode as I've already mentioned, you've got a night mode to brighten up things in low light. And for your video action, you can shoot up to 8K resolution footage or 4K at 30 or 60 frames per second. And if you are the kind of person who shoots a lot of home movies, you like to record everything that goes on in your life, well, you should be more than happy with the Xiaomi 12T Pro. 
This thing churned out sharp, good looking footage at 4K and 8K resolution, no issues whatsoever, with impressive stabilisation and clear audio pickup. However, while I'm really happy with that HP One camera sensor around back, the front facing 20 megapixel selfie shooter ain't quite as impressive. You've got a pretty narrow 78 degree field of view and this struggles in softer light, especially if your hand isn't particularly steady because you happen to be consuming a beer the size of Bulgaria. In better lighting it is fine even with strong backlighting, although the edge detection in portrait mode can be a bit shonky. And you certainly can't shoot 4K or 8K resolution video with the 20 meg selfie cam either. You are limited to full HD at either 30 or 60 frames per second. And in more ambient light, everything does look a little bit noisy and crap, but it's absolutely fine for, you know, your Skyping, your Zooming, whatever. And Xiaomi also impressed it in 2022 with its mighty 12S Ultra, which packs yet another 200 megapixel sensor, this time from Sony, which Xiaomi actually helped to co-design. Unfortunately, the Xiaomi 12S Ultra is China only, so it's going to be a bit of a ball ache, important and such forth if you do fancy one. And another 200 megapixel monster is Motorola's Edge 30 Ultra, a near 7 inch beast that, like the Xiaomi 12T Pro, boasts high end specs, but this time with more of a stock Android vibe. It's an enjoyable everyday blower and that 200 meg camera is a beaut, although once again don't expect a full res image every time you hit the shutter button. I turned on the smart high resolution feature in the Ultra's drag down settings before I began testing and I found that this activated basically all of the time when shooting daytime snaps, giving you 50 meg images that are packed with fine detail and rather natural looking colours. It's only in more ambient conditions where that pixel binning is ramped up to brighten your shot. And this results in a 12.6 meg image that still often looks good when you check it out on a bigger screen, although dim light does mean a serious detail drop. Alternatively, Motorola has also included a 200 megapixel ultra res mode, which can capture finer detail in decent light. It takes a wee while to shoot a pic, but it's handy if you later want to crop into a photo in lieu of a proper dedicated telephoto lens. Of course, these snaps are bloody massive in size, often weighing in at around the sort of 50 to 60 megabyte range, so you'll want to use this feature sparingly. The Moto Edge 30 Ultra's massive sensor can absorb a lot of light, which works out great for your low light shots, as does the optical image stabilization to counter any small handshakes. The night mode still helps to slightly boost the brightness on occasion, but often it's not even necessary. So overall, gotta say, I was impressed by the Moto Edge 30 Ultra's main camera. It's versatile and it's not put off by crappy or harsh lighting. And you've also got the usual Motorola AI help as well if you don't want to think too hard about framing your shot. You've also got yourself a 50 meg ultra wide angle shooter which employs quad pixel binning to again churn out bright good looking pics even when the conditions aren't amazing. My test shots came out pretty well, the ultra can grab quite natural images that still look sharp when you chuck them up on a telly or a monitor. And the final lens slapped on that rear end is a 12 meg portrait shooter with a 2x telephoto finish offering a narrow depth of field for a sexy bokeh style effect. Again, this does its job pretty well. Occasionally the edge detection will get a little confused and your subject will need to stay stock still in more ambient light or you'll get now but blur, but overall it is good stuff. Your home movies will look pretty ruddy good too as the Moto Edge 30 Ultra can record 8K res video or 4K video at 30 or 60 frames per second with the option of HDR10+. Colours are boosted slightly when shooting at 4K res or above, but overall the Ultra does a good job for capturing home movies or just clips to share online, with top-notch stabilisation and some great audio pickup too. Even fairly blustery conditions don't balk the sound too much at all, although the focus does occasionally struggle in lower light. Flip to the front and you'll find a mighty 60 megapixel selfie snapper waiting to shoot your face. This again handles a range of conditions to keep you looking as sharp as possible, although it's not quite as effective for colour capture and it does struggle in much softer light unless you use the screen flash. I've also got to give a shout out to the Huawei Mate 50 Pro which boasts some incredible optics that are superior to pretty much anything out there in low light and ambient conditions. However, as is sadly the way with Huawei these days, you don't get any of those lovely Google services packed onto the P50 Pro which could be a deal breaker for many. And if you happen to know your way around a DSLR or two, well chances are you'll get on pretty bloody well with the Sony Xperia 1 Mark IV and Xperia 5 Mark IV. These flagships boast the usual versatile professional camera tools and incredibly fast eye tracking, along with the ability to shoot 4K 120 frames per second video with all of the main lenses. 
And while I haven't yet tested out the more expensive Xperia 1 Mark IV, I have fully reviewed the Xperia 5 Mark IV, which boasts a more compact form yet still rocks pretty much the exact same specs, almost the same camera hardware and the same slick DSLR style shooting experience. When you first load it up, it'll be in basic mode. In this mode, you can swap between photo and video, and you can also shoot selfies using the front face in camera tech, if you like. Hello. However, you can cycle between the different modes just by tapping up here and then flicking on through them. In the auto mode, you've got very limited control. You can piddle about with the focal area and mode, and that's about it. The camera will basically handle everything else, although you can manually flick between the three different lenses as well. And then if you keep on flicking, you get to the likes of the programmable mode. In this mode, you can have a proper play around with the different white balance modes. You can control the ISO levels, the EV, and get exactly the kind of shot that you want. The Xperia 5 Mark IV's 12 meg 24mm primary sensor with optical image stabilisation can generally capture good looking pics on auto mode with minimal input and no heavy processing. But it does saturate HDR shots and it can struggle in all kinds of tricky lighting. The best performance comes from the program mode where you can quickly tinker with that EV, the ISO etc. And you get to see the results accurately represented on screen. With some time and care you can get some great looking shots even when the light is in full on twat mode and it's very rare to see any lens flare or other issues like that. As well as that 24mm lens, you've got a 12 megapixel 16mm shooter that can capture an ultra wide snap when you need to fit more into frame, albeit with the usual impact on colour temperature. And you've also got a 12 meg telephoto shooter slapped on the back end, although it's not a variable range zoom lens like what you got in the Xperia 1. This one is locked at 60mm unfortunately due to the general space constraints on this smartphone. This maxes out at a 7.5 times total zoom and the results are comparable to simple digital crops on ultra high res smartphone sensors, but it is still handy for getting a closer view of the action when you're shooting scenery or an unobtrusive family shot. The real time eye autofocus is supported across all three lenses now, so it just gives you a little bit of freedom to experiment with your shots. And Sony has apparently upgraded the real time object tracking on here as well using fresh new Clever Clogs AI shenanigans. Although it's tough to say how effective this upgrade has been because Sony phones have always been great at keeping action shots sharp. And the Mark IV is another banger in that respect. As long as you're not shooting in very low light, then people and pets will stay crisp. That's something that's helped along by the burst shot mode as well. Just hold down that shutter button, you'll get 20 frames per second auto exposure and auto focus as well, now with HDR support. For home movies, you'll want to swap to the Cinema Pro app. And in here you can shoot 4K video at up to 120 frames per second, again with all three lenses and once again with full control over the camera settings and focus. However, shooting 4K footage at 30 frames per second, even just for a couple of minutes or so, does often cause a big fat nasty warning warning phone is overheating message to flash up on the screen which then disables a load of the features. So unless you're capturing really short clips, you do unfortunately tend to have to stick to full HD resolution. You will once again need to tinker with the settings to get the best possible results of course, especially when you're shooting in ambient light, but the image stabilisation is as great as ever. As long as you know your restraints, then you can get some good looking footage. You've got live streaming support built into this thing, so again, great news for creators. And if you happen to have a, a Sony Alpha DSLR as well, you can use this thing as an external monitor. And last up is the 12 meg selfie shooter, boasting a larger sensor than the previous generation for better low light results. It is still shonky at times, however, especially with brighter backgrounds, definitely not as good as many rivals, unfortunately. And if you dive into the basic camera mode as well, you can also shoot video using that front facing camera at up to 4K resolution, absolutely does the job fine for a simple bit of vlogging like so, or you're Skyping your teams and all that good stuff. And there you have it, my lovelies. That's my personal pick of the very best camera phones of 2022 right now that I've personally tested and reviewed. But have I missed out your own top favorite camera smartphone of 2022? Well, definitely clue me in as to what a massive knobber I am down below and let me know what your personal picks would be. And for more on the latest and greatest tech, please do plug subscribe, ding that notifications bell, and have yourselves a ruddy wonderful rest of the week. Cheers, everyone. Love you.